You could say I traded in chaos for candy when I met Ben. My days used to be filled with managing disasters and cleaning up corporate messes, but then love swept in, and before I knew it, I was knee-deep in sugar and spice and everything nice at Sugar Haven, Ben's family candy store. It wasn't long before I took over the store's finances, and we started to see some real success. Good morning, love. Ben greeted me one Monday as I stepped into the sweet aroma of our shop. His smile was infectious, and despite the tension that was brewing, it was a reminder of why I was here. Morning, I replied, flipping through the mail. Bills mostly, which I have learned to manage like a pro. Sales are up this month. That new chocolate line is a hit, I said, trying to keep things positive. Ben shrugged a bit too casually. Yeah, well, that's all you, isn't it? Mom still thinks I'm the candy king. He chuckled, but I could tell the words weighed on him more than he let on. Speaking of the devil, Linda waltzed in, all smiles and no sense of personal space. Benjamin, my boy, you've outdone yourself. The store looks fabulous, she beamed, patting her son on the back. Her gaze then slid over to me, and her lips pursed just slightly. Anna still playing shopkeeper, I see. I let out a soft sigh. Good morning, Linda. And yes, playing shopkeeper is keeping us in the black, I responded, keeping my tone even. It was too early for a spat, and the last thing I wanted was to give her the satisfaction of seeing me ruffled. Numbers, numbers, she said, waving a hand in dismissal. You should leave that to the accountants and help my son with the real business. Her eyes glinted with that all too familiar mix of disdain and condescension. Before I could answer, Ben stepped in. Mom, Anna's doing more than fine. We're doing great because she's got a head for business. He slipped an arm around my waist in a silent show of solidarity. Linda sniffed, clearly not convinced. Well, as long as my boy is happy, I suppose that's what matters. With that, she flounced off to the other side of the store, presumably to find some other way to remind us of her presence. Ben squeezed my side apologetically. Don't let her get to you, he murmured. I shook my head, forcing a smile. I'm not. Let's just focus on the shop, okay? And focus we did. With each day, Sugar Haven became more than just a candy store. It was our little piece of paradise. At least, that's what I thought until everything began to crumble. I started noticing the changes when the deliveries got more frequent and they weren't full of sugar or spice, but things that had price tags that made my stomach drop. Another package, Ben? I asked one evening as I locked up the register. I held up a sleek gadget still in its shiny packaging. It looked expensive. Oh, that's the new phone I ordered, Ben said with a grin as he cut open the box like a kid on Christmas. Top of the line. I raised an eyebrow. Don't we have other things to invest in? The mixer in the back has been making that funny noise. Ben dismissed me with a wave of his hand, his attention fixed on peeling the protective film off his new toy. It's fine, Anna. We've got to treat ourselves too, you know. A part of me wanted to argue, to remind him of the thin line we were walking financially, but I bit my tongue. It wasn't just the phone either. Linda had taken to showing off new outfits every other week, parading through Sugar Haven like it was her personal runway. Anna, look at this dress. Isn't it just darling? Linda twirled in a floral number that had to cost more than we made in a day. It's nice, I said, keeping my voice neutral. But aren't we supposed to be saving up to fix the sign out front? Linda scoffed, patting her son's cheek. Nonsense. The store is doing wonderfully. Benjamin, tell her. Ben, who had been half listening, nodded along. Yeah, we're doing great, Anna. Don't worry so much. That was the problem, though. I did worry. I worried every time I looked at our books and saw the numbers that didn't add up. Doing great wasn't the term I would use when every profit we made was being swallowed by personal purchases. Look, I'm just saying we should be careful. I tried again later that week as we sat down to look at our finances. Maybe we can set a budget for personal expenses. 
Ben looked at me like I'd suggested we sell the store and become circus performers. A budget? Come on, Anna. We're not that bad, and it's not like you to be stingy. It stung that word, stingy. I wasn't being stingy. I was being sensible. It's not about being stingy, Ben. It's about being smart. We have to think about the future of Sugar Haven. He didn't seem to hear me, though, already scrolling through a website for another purchase. You worry too much, he said, half distracted. It'll all work out. Things took a turn when Linda decided to bring in some extra help. It was a Tuesday, I remember, because Tuesdays were inventory days, and I was elbow deep in organizing our latest shipment of candy jars when she walked in, arm in arm with a girl who couldn't have been older than 20. Anna, this is Tessa, Linda announced with a flourish. Tessa, dear, this is Anna, my son's assistant. I straightened up, wiping my hands on my apron. Nice to meet you, Tessa, but I'm actually the co-manager here. Tessa offered a smile that didn't quite reach her eyes. I've heard a lot about you. I'm really excited to be part of the team. I glanced at Linda, whose smug look was enough to tell me she hadn't consulted Ben about this new development. What exactly will Tessa be assisting with? I asked, trying to keep my tone friendly. Oh, she's going to be helping out with the business side of things. You can only do so much, after all, Linda said with a dismissive glance at my inventory list. I nodded, still a bit confused. All right, well, we have a system here, so I'll have to bring her up to speed. It didn't take long for me to see that Tessa's version of helping out was more about hovering and less about doing actual work. When I saw the salary Ben's mother had set for her, I nearly choked. Ben, can we talk? I cornered him later that day in the office. Sure, what's up, he asked, not looking up from his computer. It's about Tessa. Her salary is, it's more than what we can afford for the role she's in. Ben finally looked up, his brow furrowing. Mom said it was fine. She thinks Tessa's going to bring a lot to the table. I sighed, feeling like I was talking to a wall. We agreed to discuss new hires together, especially when it comes to how much we're paying them. He shrugged, that annoyingly dismissive gesture becoming more frequent. What's done is done. Mom has a good feeling about her. I had to bite back a retort. Good feelings didn't balance books. I left the office feeling like I was the only one seeing the red flags while Ben and his mother were content to parade around with blindfolds. I've always been the kind to check twice, maybe three times, especially when it comes to numbers. So when I stumbled upon an envelope stuffed in the back of a filing cabinet while hunting for a misplaced invoice, my first thought was that it was just another forgotten bill. But as I flipped through the papers, my heart started to race, not from excitement, but from cold, hard dread. It was a loan document with Sugar Haven listed as collateral, and the amount was far more than what would ever be considered reasonable for our modest shop. Ben, I said, walking into his cluttered office, papers in hand. What is this? He glanced up, and I saw his eyes flicker, the first sign of guilt I'd seen in him in months. Oh, that. It's nothing. Just a small loan I took out to cover, you know, store improvements. Store improvements, I echoed, incredulous. This amount could renovate the store five times over. What did you really use it for? There was a pause long enough for the truth to wedge itself between us. Okay, look, he started, and I could tell he was choosing his words carefully. I might have used some of it for the house, the one I've been working on for us. For us? I repeated, my voice sharp with disbelief. Or for your gadgets and whatever else you've been blowing money on. He stood up then, his chair scraping back with a sound that felt like a gavel on my patience. It's not like that, Anna. You don't understand. This is all going to pay off in the end. I shook my head. No, Ben. Taking out a loan against the store without telling me, that's what I don't understand. How could you be so reckless? Before he could answer, Linda bustled in, her nose wrinkling as she saw the papers in my hand. What's all this about, she demanded. Ben tried to explain, but I cut him off, 
thrusting the loan papers at her. Did you know about this? She barely glanced at the documents before waving them off. Of course I did. Ben's just doing what's necessary for our future. And who are you to question him? You're just the help after all. The words stung, but more than that, they fueled a fire in me. Just the help? I said, my voice low but firm. I've been keeping the store afloat while you two have been treating it like your personal bank account. Ben's face had gone pale, and Linda looked like she was about to spit fire. You ungrateful little. No, I interrupted, my calm surprising even myself. What's ungrateful is not recognizing the hard work someone's been putting into this business. What's foolish is risking everything for a house that we don't even need. I waited for them to say something to defend themselves, but all they did was stare at me, caught in the act. I left the room then, the documents clutched in my hand like a verdict yet to be delivered. The kitchen table was never really meant for business meetings, but that day it was surrounded by the most solemn faces, as if we were about to discuss matters of state instead of the confectionery. Ben cleared his throat, his eyes not quite meeting mine. We need to talk about the store's future. I sat down, folding my hands on the table. We already did that when I found the loan documents. Linda huffed from across the table, her arms crossed. We need to be realistic, Anna. The store isn't pulling in enough to cover the debts. We have to find money somewhere. There it was, the we that really meant me. I kept my voice steady. What do you suggest? Her eyes gleamed with a kind of cold calculation. You have that inheritance from your parents. It could cover the debts and get the store back on its feet. I felt like I was listening to a stranger, not the woman whose son I had married. You want me to use my parents' money, the money they left for me for my future? Ben finally spoke up. It's not like you're doing anything else with it. That money was meant for me, for my security, I said, the disbelief clear in my voice. And what about our security? Linda shot back. You're part of this family now, aren't you? I looked between them, my heart sinking. I am, but it seems you only remember that when you need something from me. Ben shifted uncomfortably. It's not like that, but we're drowning here, Anna. So you expect me to just hand over my future, just like that? I asked. Linda leaned forward. If you care about this family, yes. I thought of the long hours, the sleepless nights, the sacrifices. I had made for the store. If I do this, if I invest my inheritance, I want a third of the store. I want to be an official co-owner. The room fell silent. Then Linda laughed, a harsh sound that bounced off the walls. You, co-owner, don't be ridiculous. You're not business material. I stood up, my chair scraping loudly against the floor. Then you find another way to cover your debts because my inheritance is not your emergency fund. Ben's face was unreadable, but Linda's was red with anger. You'd let this family business go under. I've tried to save it, I said, my voice quiet but firm. But I won't set myself on fire to keep you warm. I wasn't one for late-night visits to the shop, but something in my gut told me to go to Sugar Haven that evening. The place was dark, which was expected, but the faint glow of a light from the back office wasn't. I pushed the door open, the familiar tinkle of the bell sounding almost ominous in the silence. The sweet scent of confectionery that usually comforted me now felt heavy, loaded with the scent of betrayal. As I walked towards the back, the murmurs from the office grew clearer. Then I saw them through the partly open door, Ben with his arms around the new assistant, Tessa, who giggled at something he whispered in her ear. I pushed the door open fully, and they sprang apart, their expressions turning from shock to guilt within seconds. Anna, Ben stammered, straightening his shirt. What are you? It's not what it looks like. I crossed my arms, feeling a cold calm settle over me. Really? Because it looks like I just caught my husband with his arms around another woman. Tessa was smoothing her hair back, looking anywhere but at me. We were just going over inventory. At midnight, with the inventory in your arms, 
I said, my tone dry. Ben's eyes were pleading now. Anna, please, you're blowing this out of proportion. I laughed, short and humorless. Am I? Because from where I'm standing, it looks pretty clear to me. He took a step towards me, and I held up a hand. Save it, Ben. I don't know what's worse, the cheating or the pathetic lies. Tessa finally spoke up, her voice small. I'm sorry, Anna. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. I looked at her, really looked at her, young, naive, and caught in the web of a man who couldn't take responsibility for his actions. You should be, and you should also be looking for another job. Ben's protest was immediate. You can't fire her for this. I turned to him, my resolve stealing. I can and I will, and I'll be looking for a good lawyer in the morning. His face paled. Anna, please, let's talk about this. There's nothing to talk about, I said, cutting him off. You've made your choices. Now you get to live with them. I didn't wait for his response. I walked out of there with my head held high, the sound of Ben calling after me fading into the background. The morning after I caught Ben was bright, a stark contrast to the mood in our home. I'd spent the night at my own place, the one I kept as a rental property. As I sat at the kitchen table, my phone buzzed with a message from Ben. I considered not even reading it, but curiosity got the better of me. It was a photo of a bank letter addressed to Ben, the words, final notice, and immediate repayment required standing out. Beneath it, he typed a message, we need to talk, this is serious. I typed back a simple, on my way, and got ready to face the music. When I arrived at the confectionery, Ben and Linda were already there, pacing like caged animals. Linda spotted me first, and her expression soured. Decided to show up, did you? She snapped as I walked in. I nodded, holding her gaze. You wanted to talk. Ben held out the letter to me. The bank's coming down hard. We could lose everything. I scanned the letter, the numbers not surprising me but still making my stomach turn. So what's your plan? Linda's plan was apparently to glare daggers at me. We wouldn't be in this mess if you just helped us when we asked. Ignoring her, I addressed Ben. What are you going to do? He ran a hand through his hair, looking defeated. We, I thought you could pay it off with your inheritance. My laugh was bitter, and I told you I'm not doing that without a stake in the business. Linda stepped forward. You're being unreasonable, Anna. This is a family business. I met her challenge with a calm I didn't feel. And where was this family when your son was spending money we don't have and hiring his friends for fun? Ben started to say something but stopped, his eyes dropping to the floor. You don't get to play the family card only when it suits you, I continued. We'll figure something else out then, Ben muttered. You'll have to, I agreed. Then Linda did something unexpected. She smiled, but it wasn't pleasant. Fine. But if you're not going to help, then you're out. We'll manage without you. You're fired. I stared at her, letting the silence stretch out. Before I matched her smile with my own. Okay. Their surprise was almost comical. Just like that. Ben asked, his voice incredulous. Just like that, I confirmed. But I want you to know, I took photos of you and Tessa. I have records of all the money you've wasted. If you think you can fire me and sweep all this under the rug, you're wrong. Linda's smile vanished. You wouldn't dare. Oh, but I would. And when I leave, I'm taking all my hard work with me. You can explain to the bank why the business is about to tank without the person who was actually running it. Months had passed since I last set foot in Sugar Haven, and life had taken on a new kind of normal. The crisp sound of papers, the hum of focused conversations, and the sight of crisis management and resolution had replaced the scent of sugar and spice. I sat in my new office, a stark contrast to the confectioner's back room, when my phone rang. Glancing at the caller ID, I saw it was Claire, a former employee at the shop and the only one I still talked to. Hey, Claire, what's up? I greeted with a hint of caution. News about Sugar Haven always carried a tinge of the past. You haven't heard then. 
Claire's voice was a mix of pity and discomfort. The shop they closed down last week. The bank foreclosed on them and the house too. I leaned back in my chair, a weight lifting off my shoulders that I hadn't realized was there. I see, and Ben and his mother. There was a pause. They're not doing great. Rumor has it they've moved in with his aunt. No one's seen them much. I sighed, not quite sure how to feel. Thanks for letting me know, Claire. She hesitated before adding, Anna, everyone knows you were the heart of that place. It was never the same after you left. A small, sad smile touched my lips. I appreciate you saying that. How about you? Found a new job yet? Yeah, I'm working at a bakery downtown. It's not Sugar Haven, but it's a start. That's great to hear. You always had a talent for baking. I'm sure you'll do well there. We chatted for a few more minutes before saying goodbye. I hung up and looked out the window at the bustling street below. There was a knock at my door and my assistant peeked in. Your three o'clock is here, Anna. Thanks, send them in, I responded, shaking off the remnants of nostalgia. The clients came in, a husband and wife team looking worried about their own business. I stood to greet them, ready to dive into another challenge. We've heard great things about you, Anna, the wife said as we sat down. They say you're the best crisis manager in town. I smiled, the title sitting comfortably with me. I'll do my best to live up to that reputation. Now tell me about your business and let's see how we can turn things around. As they spoke, I listened already forming strategies in my mind. This was my world now, where every problem had a solution and every crisis was an opportunity. Sugar Haven and its bitter memories were behind me, and ahead was a path that I had forged for myself, a path of resilience, redemption, and rebirth. The meeting stretched on, the client's initial anxiety giving way to hopeful smiles as we discussed possibilities. They left with a renewed sense of purpose, and I turned back to my desk, my heart lighter than it had been in a long time. In the end, I realized that sometimes the sweetest outcomes come after the most bitter trials, and the future was mine to create, one careful step at a time.